lives on in value and usage, you know, for a very long time. The PPC route as an idea actually was inspired by the National Semiconductor NS7100. I was asked by National to go up to uh, San Francisco Bay Area for a weekend and sit down and bang on a, uh, a hardware breadboard of the 7100 and uh, talk about pressure, you know. And so I, I worked for Saturday and I worked for Sunday and then I, I told them my findings. Oh yeah, we knew that, we knew that. Ooh, this just paid for your trip, you know. <laughs> the vision was uh, uh, to ask PP, PPC members to actually uh, create the ROM. And the philosophy and the idea behind the whole thing was a single point of reference. The idea uh, was actually uh, conceived in 1977, as I mentioned, a uh, visit to National. A discussion with Frank Volz. I haven't seen Frank since, but uh, he'd come by the clubhouse and we'd have these discussions. The 7100 features uh, simulates routines and ROMs. That was part of it. And I was so enamored with the idea. And there is a advertisement for the never released National in a catalog that Thomas brought me today. Excellent. If you want to see it later. Uh, I was so inspired by the idea, I sat down and spent some time actually <coughs> laying out uh, a routines ROM and laying out what routines should be in there. And I sent a letter on February 16th, 1977. It was a 10-page letter to National. Of course, they totally ignored me. And in August 1979, I proposed it in a letter uh, to the uh, members. And in late August 1979, I sent a formal letter to HP because, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the 41 was introduced in, uh, I think it was July. July 16th. There you go. So you can see how on, uh, you know, how we're right, right on top of this new machine. And I sent a letter of formal intent, and along with it, I sent a, in $2,011, which was $1,000 and, and, and $1979, uh, for $2,736 to show that we're serious. What is the PPC Round Vision? Use the 4,000 at that time, worldwide PPC membership to write a programmer's ROM. <clears throat> Do it because it is a good idea. Do it because we are 41 inspired as a personal computer. And focal is easy to learn. And we use very modern communication techniques to do this. We mail the monthly newsletter. We have a telephone and a phone bulletin. All of this, of course, is preempt internet. Yes, one of the members donated to me an answering machine. That's what it was. I thought, how can I use this? And, and first of all, why are you giving this to me? He says, well, I bought it for my business. He bought a, a high quality professional machine, and my customer didn't like it. So I said, fine. So how, how can I use it? So I would uh, take one or two or three minute messages, you know, write out the script, and then I would say, you know, like. Uh, uh, one, 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 this is PPC around uh, Mosa number one. And the reason I repeated the number in the beginning was because back in those days, the system wasn't so fast. And if you'd already heard one, you could put it down and you weren't charged for the, for the call. So, so you could repeatedly interrogate this, this phone bulletin and you could get updates. And, I, and that was a system that was in play to for us to work and develop ideas. I believe the phone bulletin was responsible for saving hundreds of HP 97 printers because of the non-normalized numbers that people, favorite trick of certain kinds of people, they go into a dealer's showroom, and of course we had you know, the 97 sitting on the counter shop, they'd read it in a card and walk away. And the next time somebody played with the machine, smoke started coming up. So, oh. so uh, that, that non-normalized number was replaced to do the same function, but it wouldn't cook, leave the elements of the card reader on. Uh, the idea was stop complaining to HP, let's just do it what we think is right. The, if the idea is so good, let's prove it. Well-defined objectives make dec makes decision making easy. Yes. The more clear you are, you got two guys who are my routine, spend my routine better. Yeah, but which one's the shortest and the fastest? 
Oh, well, his is. Any more questions? <laughs> documentation is a vital part of programming. This was a very key thing. I guess by now you figured out that I'm hung up on documentation. Share your researches and efficiency is vital. One of the big things of the PPC realm was the use of synthetic programming. That's a whole subject of itself. It's an incredible part of HP calculator history. What was shipped? <coughs> Each box, which is about a cubic foot, weighed a little over 10 pounds, 10 and a half pounds, something like that. We got two manuals, two quick reference guides, two hex cards, and two runs. What is missing besides the box and heat shrink tubing? Can anybody remember what else? I left something out on this list. Come on, you guys, you said you knew what it was. There was a letter in it, and it explained it. And part of that letter had little rows and columns of black on white, just like our sign up here. This was an insane idea that we had for this ROM, and I'll mention it again. Yes. I, uh, would you mention as to why there was two of everything? Because I got one of these, and I remember this. Well, I think it's in here. If it's if I don't cover it, because I don't remember exactly what's in here, that's a vital piece of information. A vital piece of. Uh, two manuals. There was actually a bound manual. Actually, there's four. Well, actually, there was four manuals. That's correct. There's four manuals. Uh, this is a, is a bound manual, perfect, what I would call a perfect bound manual. And then there was the same manual with no binding, loose leaf, so you put it into a binder, feed it through a scanner, that kind of thing. Okay, just a few facts about the PPC ROM. Uh, the idea germinates for two and a half years. Proposal to members to completion is two more years. 5,000 ROMs are initially produced. To each per order, that's the question you're asking. The, sh the shipment to members was 30,000 pounds. <laughs> now just imagine 5,000 boxes, a total of 30,000 pounds. You have to gather the stuff, put it into a box, shrink wrap certain things, close the box, and load it onto a truck in one day using the largest warehouse in Los Angeles, so large it had a freight rail right through the warehouse. Remember, Richard? 15 tons of what do you get? <laughs> <laughs> Another day older and deeper in debt. <laughs> um, member money was collected as $652,360. I collected from members. I put it into a personal banking account and I sat on it for two years. Okay. <laughs> and I can tell you stories about that. Um, I'll tell you one. When I started the project, I was concerned about handling this money. I really hate handling other people's money. That's why I don't like being the banker for this conference. But I called the IRS to ask them to make sure I understood what I was doing. I, I called them three different times, giving them three different examples. My first example is I, I was talking to my friend at the Cadillac dealership. And he was trying to sell me a Cadillac. Let's say it was $25,000. And then he made some remark that it's cheaper by the dozen. Ooh, cheaper by the dozen. How much cheaper? Oh, $10,000 cheaper. Ooh, all I can do is find 11 more people. And we can each save $10,000. Can I collect the money, buy the Cadillacs, and distribute them? Sure, no problem. Well, there's no taxes, no nothing, right? Well, as long as you do it right. If you collect the money, you can't collect interest on it because you have to pay taxes on that. But yeah, no problem. You don't have to report it, you just do it. Another example I gave them was, I have a, I have a friend who's a famous artist and we want him to, to uh, make a painting for us, but you know, he wants 50 grand to do this. And I want to have him paint the painting, we're going to reproduce the painting, distribute it to all the people that we collected the, the money to make that $50,000 to commission them to do the painting. How can I do that? Well, no problem. Just don't earn any interest in, in all these things for the IRS. The mask for the ROM was $46,513. And when I gave the um, money to HP, there was a fellow at HP, he was a field sales guy, his name was Gary Bachman. Now Gary, I think, is still alive today. But Gary, soon after this little thing, left HP. Guess what career he left it for? He became an operatic 
singer and a successful one. Wow. He didn't fit the HP mold. <laughs> Some more statistics, uh, 10,000 uh, 500 page manuals were printed. The manual is so popular that we had a second printing of 10,000. 153 routines loaded in AK ROM. Now, kind of, there's really 120 or 122 official labels, and a label is, if you look in this book, you see this, uh, this here's a HN. All routines were two letters to make it quick and easy to key in the machine. Efficiency was thing, and this reverse white on black is used throughout the manual. That was the insane idea, believe me. I'm glad we did it. Nine months was spent on producing the manual artwork. Remember, this was done back before any kind of word processing or word or anything like that. I took big sheets. <coughs> I had a printer print up a, a, a layout sheet which had the, you know, the margin thing on there, printed light blue, non-photo blue. And we we'd have, we bought a waxer and we we type up, you know, a single column all the text. And then we'd cut it on a paper cutter, and then I'd run through the wax and wax on, and then we'd put it on the layout sheets, and you have, you know, 500 of these pieces. This is the way we did stuff in those days, right? Hundreds of members, members participated in the project, and, and I calculated this very carefully, using very conservative numbers, because it is an astounding claim. I claim that over one man century of work was done on this project. All volunteer, not a penny was paid to any person of the PPC RAM project. Uh, physically, we can look at the, the ROM. These are two USB uh, thumb drives pulled out from their little cases. In 1980, HP ROM was .008 megabytes in 0.47 cubic inches. 2011 USB RAM is 2,000 or 2 gigabytes in 0.12 cubic inches. And comparing this, we have a million times memory increase in the same volume in terms of you know what, what that is. ROM management. We had four categories of the ROM routines. We divide, divide them up four people. Synthetic routines, Dr. Keith Jarrett, we lost track of Eric says he's still alive. Math routines, John Kennedy. He was a math professor for a long time at the Santa Monica College. He's recently retired. John and I have sort of kept in touch. Because at one time, he and I started writing in an RPN book. And when I mentioned to him, I found attractive down and managed to get his email address. I mentioned to him, uh, that he reminded him of that. And he said, I said, can you send me all your files? And he did email, email me all the stuff that he did because I collect RPN stuff. Peripheral routines. Who did that? Who's the guy? He's not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the... Uh, um, I'm sorry, peripheral routines is Jake. I did the housekeeping routines and the four of us manage these routines and when we started getting all this stuff together there was always problems and there was one person that 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 we could always go to uh, with regards to uh, working out some of the issues uh, and that is Dr. Roger Hill sitting right over here he took a year off am I, am I correct Roger? Remember, that was my remember? first sabbatical year okay wow. teaching to dedicate at, you know, 24-7 in the final hours of this project, you know, long distance phone calls to Roger and he'd be debugging and, you know, the stuff that Cyril goes through every day and kind of thing. And, uh, of course, we dedicated the ROM manual to him and this is a photocopy of the front page of the manual. The manual. And what's interesting is while the PPC ROM while it still has a lot of utility. The point was that we selected, carefully selected, very important applications programs in, in routine form that you would call from your normal program. Uh, <clears throat> while those were for the 41, but they are still good RPN programs. In fact, a lot of this stuff is being going over to the, the 34S. Uh, did, I, did I go backwards? No, okay. 
The manual, I mentioned about the weight and statistics. We, we, we designed it, we wrote it, we typeset it. What we did do, because we felt like every user feels that the manufacturer doesn't have a clue what should be in the user's manual. Now I have to say, and H, give HP's credit, they've been refining and refining. Their manuals, I think, are, are pretty real good for all the machines they're doing today. They're, they really are. But what we did is we divided up what information you needed under various headings, and they were an example. You have name of the routine, an example using it right there. Complete instructions, the background of the routine. What, where did this come from? What's, what's kind of a, the history of the routine? We had a further discussion of the routine. Applications programs, formulas used, line by line analysis, references used, and final remarks and further assistance. The original printing of the PPC ROM had names and phone numbers of people you called if you had questions. Richard, if you go back a couple of slides there. I tried them last week, they don't work. <laughs> <laughs> One more. There, there what? There. Eleven, uh, page 11. Excellent. <laughs> I pointed out no, forward to 11. Okay. Here we go. Later error in that uh, medication there. In this group, there is nothing that's incalculable. <laughs> uh, to give you an idea of how this was a mass group kind of a project, the person who did this was our, our professional magician in the club. His name was uh, Barry, Price. Barry Price, okay? And so he did the calligraphy for this. Everybody contributed in some way. Yeah, I remember him, is he still around? No, he did. <laughs> the disappearing act here. Here's a ROM manual cover. I mentioned Gary Bachman. He designed the cover. So we had an HP field sales rep participate in the ROM project. He designed the cover, did a great job. If you look at it very carefully and understand what each of those things that are in there, um, it kind of represents all of the different fields, applications, and so forth that might be involved uh, with the user of the ROM. If I, if I get funny, it's because my butcher is going down soon. So I'll hurry up. Routine names are two letters for easy entry. The names were white on black. And then here, these little things were small that in a sentence you can say, you know, uh, uh, key in this routine, and we didn't spell out the name, we would just put that little symbol in there. That meant in this artwork, we had to print up page, pages of rows and columns of these little sticky things, run it through the waxer, cut them up with the tweezers, stick these in throughout. Can you imagine that work? Tens of thousands of those little things. Part one uh, was introductory material. Part two is the ROM routine instructions. Part three is appendices A through zero. And that, and that includes things like a complete financial report, a list of all the people who participate, a list of those uh, PPC member numbers and the particular ROM number they got. Because what happened, I might as well answer your question now, Think about doing this project. If you do, you immediately discard it. But I did it, and I, and I realized that I'm in trouble because what I did was to look at the costs, say, you know, like estimating how many you're going to attend a conference, right? And then I figured out, well, if I take um, 500, I mean 500, I mean, there won't be 500 members who want to order this. Okay, so we got to do, uh, what it was, 17,000 for the mask, and, I, and so many for the orders, and that kind of a thing. So I divided it all out, and I came up with $95. That's right. Well, 2,500 people ordered. Wow. Now what do you do? You're going to give a refund? Think of the effort that takes to do that. No. The answer was to send to. Yeah. No more anything. Okay? Oh, and we numbered them, we serialized them uh, 1 to 2,500. I don't have it up there. A and B. 
Okay, the lessons learned. Number one, banks are lousy at paperwork. Here was part of the problem. I, I would get information from the bank and it would say, uh, Hosanna Jones, somewhere I might figure out that might be from Spain, but I wasn't really sure. And my account has been increased by $105. How am I going to account for this? What I want to know is his member number. Then I can jump into our database and I, I'm under control. The bank refused, all banks, I don't care who, what bank you are, banks are lousy at this. They'll transfer your money, but they won't provide you with basic information so that you know who it is. They're good at stealing your money too. <laughs> What's that? They're good at stealing your money too. Yep. Well, how would you solve the problem? Anybody got an idea? How would you solve that problem? Start her bank. I remember how you <laughs> solved it. Oh, you remember? <laughs> okay. I thought about this, I thought about this, I tried various things, and of course, appeal to the membership through the newsletter, that didn't work, because I kept having all these problems, and I'm spending hours and hours trying to keep all this paperwork straight. I came up with an idea. First name, member number, last name. <laughs> the bank considered your name as sacrosanct, and they never change it. How strange it was when a number between your names never presented a problem, and every time I got this order, I would could identify exactly that person, and that solved the problem. Is that the signature, or how did they the the signature of the check? Or? No, they, they, would, they would send you some sort of a statement, which would be their standard form, yeah. and we have some information in there, primarily the amount and the person. But that's all you could guarantee getting. You, you had to do some detective work to figure out even what country it came from. That's just the way the banks operate. At least back then. If I signed it that way, they might not accept it as a way. Like, <laughs> Only if your name is Emmett. Uh, yeah. uh, Richard, I remember when I got the issue where you talked about shipping the PPC module. You didn't you have like pickup trucks picking all this stuff up oh, to send it off? You can. Uh, when when I when we had to ship this. We, the, the ROMs arrived, we had a corner of the clubhouse which is, you know, a area like this stacked up in boxes with these, you know, 10,000 manuals and, and, and I actually had to compute the, the loading on the concrete because the weight was unbelievable and I had to stack them because I didn't have any room, I didn't go floor to ceiling. And we had all the materials and we had to bring this together and just the sheer volume of all these individual items. So I made a request to the local membership. One of our members said, well, I can get our use of our warehouse in Los Angeles. Well, that's an hour and a half drive from Orange County. Okay, we can get it for one day. Well, let's start the day early and we'll work until we drop. So I rented a state back truck and we had everybody in their cars meet there and none of us had been there. We had to come into this total unknown thing, figure out how to work the machines and divide up into crews and, and we had these big uh, uh, shrink wrapping machines up so you have a conveyor belt and okay, so put that. them in there and let them run through and we had these teams. It was like a small factory humming along doing this whole process. It was unbelievable. And then we loaded the truck and I drove to the clubhouse and we did the project in one day. The packaging was done in one day. Now, preparing the packaging for shipment, that requires that you have some space and you can lay these all out by state and by country and then you got to put labels on them and so forth. So I rented for one week a warehouse. Then, of course, we're poor and trying to save money, so I, I didn't include any power. For the warehouse. <laughs> but the warehouse, we had, we were in one building and there was another building here and and, and then and across the parking lot was the rent of the warehouse. I happened to have about 300 feet, I think that's closer to 1,000 feet, 500 feet, of round 
uh, 10 gauge stranded what's called Royal Cord. So, so I got up on the roof, ran along the roof, struck it across the valley, down into the thing, wired it into the switch box of the warehouse, wired the other end into our warehouse, and for a week I supplied power that way. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you, you cannot imagine. We finally got them all in. And again, we did this on a uh, marathon thing because we asked uh, UPS to come with their 18-wheeler to pick these all up. So I got a problem. Is how do I get all these labeled packages onto the truck? UPS driver doesn't say, oh, you've got 2,500 10-pound you know, boxes you want me to put on the truck? And so I requested help again. One person came. Hmm. Huh. Two of us uh, loaded that truck. Oh my God. <laughs> and the guy dragged himself away. <laughs> it took us like four hours and uh, all this stuff. These are just uh, some of the lessons learned here. I guess HP's customs are unique and uh, uh, large amounts of money are very tempting. There. You have no idea how the local members at meetings will talk about all. Oh, we got this money in the bank, and, and and we got we had a problem that at some point we're not accepting any more money. Well, how do you do that? You close one account, you move it to another account that nobody knows about. Now, one of our members, his name was Tom Hooper, really got into this. He said, "Okay, we're going to go down with you. We want you to get the money in cash." <laughs> and a bunch of us will bring sidearms and we'll be your bodyguard. And, then, and you can get the money and we'll go from one bank to another or something. I mean, you can't, the, you know, people kind of go funny. They, they, yes. did, they did have wire transfers back then, right? Oh, yes, they did. And I just called the bank and said, I want to close this account. Please transfer it to this account. And nobody could then deposit by wire any money into this account. If they can't deposit it, they can't, you know, I won't know who they are, and it's just done. At some point, you're done. You're 2,500, you're done. <clears throat> That's it. Any questions? Uh, obviously, DT is display test, and that's what it does. And that's synthetic, by the way. Yes, in the mirror. Any, bug, uh, any bugs discovered in the PPSRAM afterwards? There have been very few. That, and when I was reviewing the manual and going through this, what bugged me no end, I'd read some <laughs> of this stuff, oh, two things. And I'd come to a name, oh no, he's gone, you know. I mean, this is 30 years, right? The other thing that bugged me was I'd come to DT typed, and somebody didn't stick a DT label on it. <laughs> Or too many of those, but there were some errors. I do have a copy at home that has red ink across the top. It says a master corrections copy. Yes. At what point in all of this were you putting them on CDs? CDs? Do you remember Mike Markov? I remember Mike, yeah. Yeah. He was stacking up CDs, making copies of the run. His whole office cubicle was stacked toward the ceiling making CDs. You mean, you mean uh, three, three inch floppies? Yeah. CDs yeah. were not early. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a CD. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't exist. Yeah. It didn't exist yet. Yeah. yeah, but he was making yeah. copies of all of it. And, I mean, he was supposed to be working on stuff. He was working for an electric utility. <laughs> and, and what was on the floppies? I don't know. I, don't, I thought it was the swap disks that he would do. Oh, swap disks. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's a Joseph Horn project, swap disk. Yeah. Jeremy, hi. Hi. I think that he was wrong so lips. I, I, I used. Hill's um, date algorithm in programs that I wrote in Postman. And I still, they're still in all my Postman programs. And then somebody wanted uh, to see my Postman programs because they were going to run my thing. And, then, and they, they said, good programs, especially the date stuff, which, which I have credit for it in, in the notes. And and, uh, and she just used the Postman programs to write the book on knitting and all things. You, she had a lot of patterns in Postman. But when she, but she used the yeah, I think the ROM actually did a very good job of accomplishing its objective. And this is this is what's very important to remember. When 
I read somewhere in there, and I don't remember how that number came about, that 20% of the 8K run is synthetic. I mean, HP says, you're on your own. <laughs> you're on your own. And that put a terrible burden on us. That if we were load up this ROM and it wouldn't work. Oh, you, uh, the, the, the stuff we went through in testing and, and, and the SDS system we had to use was clunky and slow and, 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 and say some things wouldn't work and we had to yank them out to the last minute. Uh, it, was, it was a serious image ROM building project. What sorts of things did you have to take out? Uh, one of the things that I thought was very important was a variable tone instruction. We were told the only way you could get that, you need to put in the frequency and duration. Simple thing today everybody's got, right? Uh, but that would have been right, written in microcode. Yeah. And there was a guy up at, up at HP that I met up there, and I think he was a little programmer or something, and he came to me and he said, you know, uh, uh, I'd like to get one of those ROMs. I said, well, maybe we can talk. <laughs> you know, because we weren't writing microcode at that time very much. I said, I've got two or three little routines. If you can write them for me, no problem getting a ROM. <laughs> now, I had ROMs because there was another, another difficulty, and that is, what about guaranteeing? If I have 2,500 orders, I have 2,500 ROMs, what happens if one of them is bad? Who answers to that? HP isn't going to honor any kind of warranty. There's nothing. <laughs> Here they are. Bye. So I worked out a deal with HP. And I said, well, what kind of failure rates do you have and so forth? And, and I forgot the number now, but it was fairly high. It was something like 3%. So they just sent 2,500 plus 3%. So I had a whole bag for the ROMs. Very, very little. We, in other words, we were self-insuring. Oh, I sent you know, a box to South Africa, and three months later, no, it didn't come, I sent another box, well, that's where some of them went. But we literally backed up. So I had ROMs, I knew I'd have extra ROMs, but the guy wrote the routine, and they didn't work. Oh. So, at the last minute, pulled them out. Well, yeah. um, if you were to talk to Valentin, you told me this, Gene. Valentin wrote some stuff, and apparently I didn't, they weren't accepted or something? Uh, he wrote all sorts of routines during the development phase that were all in the PPC journal and not a single one made it into the ROM. And I think that made him change his entire life's direction. <laughs> <laughs> and it was nothing personal, I assure you. Yeah, Roger? Was one of the things we wanted most was a microcode machine, or machine code uh, instruction for a non-normalized recall. That, that would say it solved a whole bunch of problems that you had to do all kinds of yeah, that kind of stuff today is just trivial, but back I then... I seem to remember that you said that it would have delayed the project by several months to include the machine code. Yeah, and again, we did have some sort of a schedule, and, yeah. and you know, once you... Once, once, oh, and when I went to pay for them, oh, I got two, then we'll, we'll wind this down. I went to Gary Bachman. I said, okay, Gary, um, you know, uh, we're ready to uh, uh, have these ROMs done, and we've got... You know, here's the code, and uh, and at that time, I, I don't know if I had the number here, but I calculated the number, but in two, 1979 dollars, it was uh, $17,000, I think it was. Yeah, that's right. And so I need to give, from this account, I need to give Gary $17,000. And when you open an account, in those days, I'm not sure how it is today, they gave you 10 checks. And they were just blank. They had, you know, the the the, uh, the, the, the count number on the bottom, the magnetic ink count number. They were not even numbered, and just lines on there for you to write. So I wrote, you know, one in the upper hand corner, check number one. And I rolled out seventeen thousand dollars. I wrote out the Hewlett Packard. And I signed it. And I gave it to him. And he took the check and went back to the office, and, and it was just the joke of the office. And he passed his check around. <laughs> and I said, go cash it. And they were flabbergasted. They got the money. <laughs> and the same thing happened to pay for the actual robs. It was much more money. And that, that, that situation, Gary Bachman said, guys, we can't work this way. You need to incorporate. Question. 
Um, how small would have the uh, PPC ROM been if it had been written in microcode rather than in uh, 41 programming? Probably bigger. It probably would have been a lot. I probably cut it in half if it was well coded. Was there a project to actually do that, to, to write a second? Oh, many years ROM? later. Many years later. But at the time, see, what you, got, what you have to understand is there's a history of the user community learning about HP products. One milestone was David Kemper taking HP 65 cards and a, a special solution he made up of iron oxide dissolved in a solvent where you dip the card in there and you dried it off and the little particles will show you the, the magnetic field. Then you sit down and you write down those ones and zeros and you, then you write a whole bunch of instructions on these cards until you've got all the digital bits of all the instructions. Then you had what's called a hex table. And we had a, a, a hex card, which was a picture of it there. When the 67 came along, the 67 was 65 compatible. So we already had a lot of it done. And so we had a new hex table. When the 41 came along, we were coming out, when, when HP announced the machine, we had so much knowledge, technically inside, that, that we just skyrocketed in terms of applying and understanding the 41. And it's all recorded in the PPC. If you get curious, you can go back. And you can just read the history through. One last, more question. Last question. Last well, question. Well, I was going to mention, probably the ROM would actually be bigger if it was all in microcode. A few functions would get smaller, but most of them would get bigger. But, but what, I, what I really wanted to say is back then, a ROM that was 20% synthetic programming, would, would have, you know, that would have been a great selling point for it, that here you're getting more for your money. But today, if you wanted to market that, you should probably say it's 80% natural. <laughs> oh, I don't remember it wasn't much. Believe me, if we have five bites, that's almost a routine. So. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to lunch this break.